This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, January 4, 1907. Chapters from my autobiography by Mark Twain. Chapter 9. Dictated December 13, 1906. As regards the coming American monarchy, it was before the Secretary of State had been heard from that the chairman of the banquet said, "'In this time of unrest it is of great satisfaction that such a man as you, Mr. Root, is chief adviser of the President.' Mr. Root then got up, and in the most quiet and orderly manner touched off the successor to the San Francisco earthquake. As a result, the several state governments were well shaken up and considerably weakened. Mr. Root was prophesying. He was prophesying, and it seems to me that no shrewder and surer forecasting had been done in this country for a good many years. He did not say, in so many words, that we are proceeding in a steady march towards eventual and unavoidable replacement of the Republic by monarchy, but I suppose he was aware that that is the case. He notes the several steps, the customary steps, which in all the ages have led to the consolidation of loose and scattered governmental forces into formidable centralizations of authority. But he stops there, and doesn't add up the sum. He is not unaware that heretofore the sum has been ultimate monarchy, and that the same figures can fairly be depended upon to furnish the same sum, whenever and wherever they can be produced, so long as human nature shall remain as it is but it was not needful that he do the adding, since any one can do it, neither would it have been gracious in him to do it. In observing the changed conditions, which in the course of time have made certain and sure the eventual seizure by the Washington government of a number of state duties and prerogatives which have been betrayed and neglected by the several states, he does not attribute those changes and the vast results which are to flow from them to any thought-out policy of any party or of any body of dreamers or schemers, but properly and rightly attributes them to that stupendous power, circumstance, which moves by laws of its own, regardless of parties and policies, and whose decrees are final, and must be obeyed by all, and will be. The railway is a circumstance, the steamship is a circumstance, the telegraph is a circumstance. They were mere happenings, and to the whole world, the wise and the foolish alike, they were entirely trivial, wholly inconsequential, indeed silly, comical, grotesque. No man, and no party, and no thought-out policy said, Behold, we will build railways and steamships and telegraphs, and presently you will see the condition and way of life of every man and woman and child in the nation totally changed unimaginable changes of law and custom will follow, in spite of anything that anybody can do to prevent it. The changed conditions have come, and circumstance knows what is following, and will follow. So does Mr. Root. His language is not unclear. It is crystal. Our whole life has swung away from the old state centers, and is crystallizing about national centers. The old barriers which kept the states as separate communities are completely lost from sight. That state power of regulation and control is gradually passing into the hands of the national government. Sometimes by an assertion of the interstate commerce power, sometimes by an assertion of the taxing power, the national government is taking up the performance of duties which under the changed conditions the separate states are no longer capable of adequately performing. We are urging forward in a development of business and social life which tends more and more to the obliteration of state lines and the decrease of state power as compared with national power. It is useless for the advocates of state rights to inveigh against the extension of national authority in the fields of necessary control where the states themselves fail in the performance of their duty. He is not announcing a policy, he is not forecasting what a party of planners will bring about, he is merely telling what the people will require and compel. And he could have added, which would be perfectly true, that the people will not be moved to it by speculation and cogitation and planning, but by circumstance, that power which arbitrarily compels all their actions, and over which they have not the slightest control. The end is not yet. It is a true word. We are on the march, but at present we are only just getting started. 
if the states continue to fail to do their duty as required by the people constructions of the constitution will be found to vest the power where it will be exercised in the national government i do not know whether that has a sinister meaning or not and so i will not enlarge upon it lest i should chance to be in the wrong it sounds like ship money come again but it may not be so intended human nature being what it is i suppose we must expect to drift into monarchy by and by it is a saddening thought but we cannot change our nature we are all alike we human beings and in our blood and bone and ineradicable we carry the seeds out of which monarchies and aristocracies are grown worship of gods titles distinctions power we have to worship these things and their possessors we are all born so and we cannot help it we have to be despised by somebody whom we regard as above us or we are not happy we have to have somebody to worship and envy or we cannot be content in america we manifest this in all the ancient and customary ways in public we scoff at titles and hereditary privilege but privately we hanker after them and when we get a chance we buy them for cash and a daughter sometimes we get a good man and worth the price but we are ready to take him anyway whether he be ripe or rotten whether he be clean and decent or merely a basket of noble and sacred and long descended offal and when we get him the whole nation publicly chafes and scoffs and privately envies and also is proud of the honor which has been conferred upon us we run over our list of titled purchases every now and then in the newspapers and discuss them and caress them and are thankful and happy like all the other nations we worship money and the possessors of it they being our aristocracy and we have to have one we like to read about rich people in the papers the papers know it and they do their best to keep this appetite liberally fed they even leave out a football bullfight now and then to get room for all the particulars of how according to the display heading rich woman fell down cellar not hurt the falling down the cellar is of no interest to us when the woman is not rich but no rich woman can fall down cellar and we not yearn to know all about it and wish it was us in a monarchy the people willingly and rejoicingly revere and take pride in their nobilities and are not humiliated by the reflection that this humble and hearty homage gets no return but contempt contempt does not shame them they are used to it and they recognize that it is their proper due we are all made like that in europe we easily and quickly learn to take that attitude towards the sovereigns and the aristocracies moreover it has been observed that when we get the attitude we go on and exaggerate it presently becoming more servile than the natives and vainer of it the next step is to rail and scoff at republics and democracies all of which is natural for we have not ceased to be human beings by becoming americans and the human race was always intended to be governed by kingship not by popular vote i suppose we must expect that unavoidable and irresistible circumstances will gradually take away the powers of the states and concentrate them in the central government and that the republic will then repeat the history of all time and become a monarchy but i believe that if we obstruct these encroachments and steadily resist them the monarchy can be postponed for a good while yet dictated december first nineteen o six an exciting event in our village hannibal was the arrival of the mesmerizer i think the year was eighteen fifty as to that i am not sure but i know the month it was may that detail has survived the wear of fifty-five years a pair of connected little incidents of that month have served to keep the memory of it green for me all this time incidents of no consequences and not worth embalming yet my memory has preserved them carefully and flung away things of real value to give them space and make them comfortable the truth is a person's memory has no more sense than his conscience and no appreciation whatever of values and proportions however never mind those trifling incidents my subject is the mesmerizer now he advertised his show and promised marvels admission as usual twenty-five cents children and negroes half price the village had heard of mesmerism in a general way but had not encountered it yet not many people attended the first night but next day they had so many wonders to tell that everybody's curiosity was fired and after that for a fortnight the magician had prosperous times 
I was fourteen or fifteen years old, the age at which a boy is willing to endure all things, suffer all things, short of death by fire, if thereby he may be conspicuous and show off before the public. And so, when I saw the subjects perform their foolish antics on the platform, and make the people laugh and shout and admire, I had a burning desire to be a subject myself. Every night, for three nights, I sat in the row of candidates on the platform, and held the magic disk in the palm of my hand, and gazed at it and tried to get sleepy. But it was a failure. I remained wide awake, and had to retire defeated like the majority. Also, I had to sit there and be gnawed with envy of Hicks, our journeyman. I had to sit there and see him scamper and jump when Simmons, the enchanter, exclaimed, "'See the snake! See the snake!' and hear him say, "'My, how beautiful!' in response to the suggestion that he was observing a splendid sunset. And so on the whole insane business. I couldn't laugh, I couldn't applaud. It filled me with bitterness to have others do it, and to have people make a hero of Hicks, and crowd around him when the show was over, and ask him for more and more particulars of the wonders he had seen in his visions, and manifest in many ways that they were proud to be acquainted with him. Hicks! <laughs> the idea! I couldn't stand it. I was getting boiled to death in my own bile. On the fourth night temptation came, and I was not strong enough to resist. When I had gazed at the disk a while, I pretended to be sleepy, and began to nod. Straight away came the professor, and made passes over my head, and down my body, and legs and arms, and finishing each pass with a snap of his fingers in the air, to discharge the surplus electricity. Then he began to draw me with the disk, holding it in his fingers, and telling me I could not take my eyes off it, try as I might. So I rose slowly, bent and gazing, and followed that disk all over the place, just as I had seen the others do. Then I was put through the other paces. Upon suggestion, I fled from snakes, passed buckets at a fire, became excited over hot steamboat races, made love to imaginary girls, and kissed them, fished from the platform, and landed mud-cats that outweighed me, and so on, all customary marvels, but not in the customary way. I was cautious at first, and watchful, being afraid the professor would discover that I was an impostor and drive me from the platform in disgrace. But as soon as I realized that I was not in danger, I set myself the task of terminating Hicks' usefulness as a subject, and of usurping his place. It was a sufficiently easy task. Hicks was born honest. I, without that encumbrance, so many people said. Hicks saw what he saw, and reported accordingly. I saw more than was visible, and added to it such details as could help. Hicks had no imagination. I had a double supply. He was born calm. I was born excited. No vision could start a rapture in him, and he was constipated as to language, anyway. But if I saw a vision, I emptied the dictionary onto it, and lost the remnant of my mind into the bargain. At the end of my first half-hour, Hicks was a thing of the past, a fallen hero, a broken idol, and I knew it, and was glad, and said in my heart, Success to crime. Hicks could never have been mesmerized to the point where he could kiss an imaginary girl in public, or a real one either, but I was competent. Whatever Hicks had failed in, I made it a point to succeed in. Let the cost be what it might, physically or morally. He had shown several bad defects, and I had made a note of them. For instance, if the magician asked, What do you see? and left him to invent a vision for himself, Hicks was dumb and blind. He couldn't see a thing, nor say a word whereas the magician soon found that when it came to seeing visions of a stunning and marketable sort, I could get along better without his help than with it. Then there was another thing. Hicks wasn't worth a tallow dip on mute mental suggestion. Whenever Simmons stood behind him and gazed at the back of his skull and tried to drive a mental suggestion into it, Hicks sat with vacant face and never suspected. If he had been noticing, he could have seen by the rapt faces of the audience that something was going on behind his back that required a response. Inasmuch as I was an impostor, I dreaded to have this test put upon me, for I knew the professor would be willing me to do something, and as I couldn't know what it was, I should be exposed and denounced. However, when my time came, I took my chance. I perceived by the tense and expectant faces of the people that Simmons was behind me willing me with all his might. I tried my best to imagine what he wanted, but nothing suggested itself. I felt ashamed and miserable then. I believed that the hour of my disgrace was come, and that in another moment I should go out of that place disgraced. 
I ought to be ashamed to confess it, but my next thought was, not how I could win the compassion of kindly hearts by going out humbly and in sorrow for my misdoings, but how I could go out most sensationally and spectacularly. There was a rusty and empty old revolver lying on the table among the properties employed in the performances. On May Day, two or three weeks before, there had been a celebration by the schools, and I had had a quarrel with a big boy who was the school bully, and I had not come out of it with credit. That boy was now seated in the middle of the house, halfway down the main aisle. I crept stealthily and impressively towards the table with a dark and murderous scowl on my face, copied from popular romance, seized the revolver suddenly, flourished it, shouted the bully's name, jumped off the platform, and made a rush for him and chased him out of the house before the paralyzed people could interfere to save him. There was a storm of applause, and the magician addressing the house said, most impressively, that you may know how really remarkable this is, and how wonderfully developed a subject we have in this boy, I assure you that without a single spoken word to guide him, he has carried out what I mentally commanded him to do to the minutest detail. I could have stopped him at a moment in his vengeful career, by a mere exertion of my will. Therefore the poor fellow who has escaped was at no time in danger. So I was not in disgrace. I returned to the platform a hero, and happier than I have ever been in this world since. As regards mental suggestion, my fears of it were gone. I judged that in case I failed to guess what the professor might be willing me to do, I could count on putting up something that would answer just as well. I was right, and exhibitions of unspoken suggestion became a favorite with the public. Whenever I perceived that I was being willed to do something, I got up and did something, anything that occurred to me and the magician, not being a fool, always ratified it. When people asked me, How can you tell what he is willing you to do? I said, It's just as easy. And they always said admiringly, Well, it beats me how you can do it. Hicks was weak in another detail. When the professor made passes over him, and said his whole body is without sensation now, come forward and test him, ladies and gentlemen, the ladies and gentlemen always complied eagerly and stuck pins into Hicks and if they went deep, Hicks was sure to wince. Then that poor professor would have to explain that Hicks wasn't sufficiently under the influence. But I didn't wince. I only suffered and shed tears on the inside. The miseries that a conceited boy will endure to keep up his reputation. And so will a conceited man. I know it in my own person, and have seen it in a hundred thousand others. That professor ought to have protected me, and I often hoped he would, when the tests were unusually severe but he didn't. It may be that he was deceived as well as the others, though I did not believe it, nor think it possible. Those were dear good people, but they must have carried simplicity and credulity to the limit. They would stick a pin in my arm and bear on it until they drove it a third of its length in, and then be lost in wonder that by a mere exercise of will-power the professor could turn my arm to iron and make it insensible to pain. Whereas it was not insensible at all, I was suffering agonies of pain. After that fourth night, that proud night, that triumphant night, I was the only subject. Simmons invited no more candidates to the platform. I performed alone, every night, the rest of the fortnight. In the beginning of the second week I conquered the last doubters. Up to that time a dozen wise old heads, the intellectual aristocracy of the town, had held out as implacable unbelievers. I was as hurt by this as if I were engaged in some honest occupation. There is nothing surprising about this. Human beings feel dishonor the most sometimes when they most deserve it. That handful of overwise old gentlemen kept on shaking their heads all the first week, and saying they had seen no marvels there that could not have been produced by collusion, and they were pretty vain of their unbelief, too, and liked to show it and air it, and be superior to the ignorant and the gullible. Particularly old Dr. Peake, who was the ringleader of the irreconcilables, and very formidable for he was an F.F.V. He was learned, white-haired, and venerable, nobly and richly clad in the fashions of an earlier and courtlier day. He was large and stately, and he not only seemed wise, but was what he seemed in that regard. He had great influence, and his opinion upon any matter was worth much more than that of any other person in the community. When I conquered him, at last, I knew I was undisputed master of the field and now, after more than fifty years, I acknowledge, with a few dry old tears, 
that I rejoiced without shame. Dictated December 2, 1906 in 1847 we were living in a large white house on the corner of Hill and Main Streets, a house that still stands, and isn't large now, although it hasn't lost a plank. I saw it a year ago and noticed that shrinkage. My father died in it, March of the year mentioned, but our family did not move out of it until some months afterward. Ours was not the only family in the house. There was another, Dr. Grant's. One day Dr. Grant and Dr. Rayburn argued a matter on the street with sword canes, and Grant was brought home multifariously punctured. Old Dr. Peake caulked the leaks, and came every day for a while to look after him. The Grants were Virginians, like Peake, and one day, when Grant was getting well enough to be on his feet and sit around in the parlor and talk, the conversation fell upon Virginia and old times. I was present, but the group were probably quite unconscious of me. I being only a lad and a negligible quantity. Two of the group, Dr. Peake and Mrs. Crawford, Mrs. Grant's mother, had been of the audience when the Richmond Theatre burned down thirty-six years before, and they talked over the frightful details of that memorable tragedy. These were eye-witnesses, and with their eyes I saw it all with an intolerable vividness. I saw the black smoke rolling and tumbling toward the sky. I saw the flames burst through it and turn red. I heard the shrieks of the despairing. I glimpsed their faces at the windows, caught fitfully through the veiling smoke. I saw them jump to their death, or to mutilation worse than death. The picture is before me yet, and can never fade. In due course they talked of the colonial mansion of the Peaks, with its stately columns and its spacious ground, and by odds and ends I picked up a clearly defined idea of the place. I was strongly interested, for I had not before heard of such palatial things from the lips of people who had seen them with their own eyes. One detail, casually dropped, hit my imagination hard. In the wall, by the great front door, there was a round hole as big as a saucer. A British cannon-ball had made it, in the War of the Revolution. It was breathtaking. It made history real. History had never been real to me before. Very well. Three or four years later, as already mentioned, I was King B and sole subject in the mesmeric show. It was the beginning of the second week. The performance was half over, and just then the majestic Dr. Peake, with his ruffled bosom and wristbands and his gold-headed cane, entered, and a deferential citizen vacated his seat beside the Grants and made the great chief take it. This happened while I was trying to invent something fresh in the way of a vision in response to the professor's remark. Concentrate your powers. Look. Look attentively. There. Don't you see something? Concentrate. Concentrate. Now then, describe it." Without suspecting it, Dr. Peake, by entering the place, had reminded me of the talk of three years ago. He had also furnished me capital, and was become my confederate, an accomplice in my frauds. I began on a vision, a vague and dim one, that was part of the game at the beginning of a vision. It isn't best to see it too clearly at first. It might look as if you had come loaded with it. The vision developed by degrees, and gathered swing, momentum, energy. It was the Richmond fire. Dr. Peake was cold at first, and his fine face had a trace of polite scorn in it. But when he began to recognize that fire, that expression changed, and his eyes began to light up. As soon as I saw that, I threw the valves wide open, and turned on all the steam and gave those people a supper of fire and horrors that was calculated to last them one while. They couldn't gasp when I got through. They were petrified. Dr. Peake had risen, and was standing and breathing hard. He said in a great voice, "'My doubts are ended. No collusion could produce that miracle. It was totally impossible for him to know those details, yet he has described them with the clarity of an eye-witness and with what unassailable truthfulness God knows I know. I saved the colonial mansion for the last night, and solidified and perpetuated Dr. Peake's conversion with a cannon-ball hole. He explained to the house that I could never have heard of that small detail which differentiated this mansion from all other Virginian mansions, and perfectly identified it. Therefore the fact stood proven that I had seen it in my vision. Locks! It is curious. When the magician's engagement closed, there was but one person in the village who did not believe in mesmerism, and I was the one. 
All the others were converted, but I was to remain an implacable and unpersuadable disbeliever in mesmerism and hypnotism for close upon fifty years. This was because I never would examine them in after life. I couldn't. The subject revolted me, perhaps because it brought back to me a passage in my life which for pride's sake I wished to forget. Though I thought, or persuaded myself I thought, I should never come across a proof which wasn't thin and cheap, and probably had a fraud like me behind it. The truth is, I did not have to wait long to get tired of my triumphs. Not thirty days, I think. The glory which is built upon a lie soon becomes a most unpleasant encumbrance. No doubt for a while I enjoyed having my exploits told and retold and told again in my presence, and wondered over and exclaimed about, but I quite distinctly remember that there presently came a time when the subject was wearisome and odious to me, and I could not endure the disgusting discomfort of it. I am well aware that the world-glorified doer of a deed of great and real splendor has just my experience. I know that he deliciously enjoys hearing about it for three or four weeks, and that pretty soon after that he begins to dread the mention of it, and by and by wishes he had been with the damned before he ever thought of doing that deed. I remember how General Sherman used to rage and swear over, "'When we were marching through Georgia!' which was played at him and sung at him everywhere he went. Still I think I suffered a shade more than the legitimate hero does, he being privileged to soften his misery with a reflection that his glory was at any rate golden and reproachless in its origin, whereas I had no such privilege, there being no possible way to make mine respectable. How easy it is to make people believe a lie, and how hard it is to undo that work again! Thirty-five years after those evil exploits of mine I visited my old mother, whom I had not seen for ten years, and being moved by what seemed to me a rather noble and perhaps heroic impulse, I thought I would humble myself and confess my ancient fault. It cost me a great effort to make up my mind. I dreaded the sorrow that would rise in her face, and the shame that would look out of her eyes, but after long and troubled reflection, the sacrifice seemed due and right, and I gathered my resolution together and made the confession. To my astonishment there were no sentimentalities, no dramatics, no George Washington effects. She was not moved in the least degree. She simply did not believe me, and said so. I was not merely disappointed, I was nettled. To have my costly truthfulness flung out of the market in this placid and confident way, when I was expecting to get a profit out of it. I asserted, and reasserted with rising heat, my statement that every single thing I had done on those long-vanished nights was a lie and a swindle. And when she shook her head tranquilly and said she knew better, I put up my hand and swore to it, adding a triumphant, "'Now what do you say?' It did not affect her at all. It did not budge her the fraction of an inch from her position. If this was hard for me to endure, it did not begin with a blister she put upon the raw when she began to put my sworn oath out of court with arguments to prove that I was under a delusion, and did not know what I was talking about. Arguments! Arguments to show that a person on a man's outside can know better what is on his inside than he does himself. I had cherished some contempt for arguments before. I have not enlarged my respect for them since. She refused to believe that I had invented my visions myself. She said it was folly, that I was only a child at the time, and could not have done it. She cited the Richmond fire and the colonial mansion, and said they were quite beyond my capacities. Then I saw my chance. I said she was right. I didn't invent those. I got them from Dr. Peak. Even this great shot did no damage. She said Dr. Peake's evidence was better than mine, and he had said in plain words that it was impossible for me to have heard about those things. Dear, dear, what a grotesque and unthinkable situation! A confessed swindler, convicted of honesty, and condemned to acquittal by circumstantial evidence furnished by the swindled. I realized with shame and with impotent vexation that I was defeated all along the line. I had but one card left, but it was a formidable one. I played it and stood from under. It seemed ignoble to demolish her fortress after she had defended it so valiantly. But the defeated know not mercy. I played that master-card. It was the pin-sticking. I said solemnly, I give you my honor. A pin was never stuck into me without causing me cruel pain. She only said, It is thirty-five years. I believe you do think that, now. 
but I was there, and I know better. You never winced." She was so calm, and I was so far from it, so nearly frantic. "'Oh, my goodness,' I said, let me show you that I am speaking the truth. Here is my arm. Drive a pin into it. Drive it to the head. I shall not wince." She only shook her gray head, and said, with simplicity and conviction, "'You are a man now, and could dissemble the hurt. But you were only a child then, and could not have done it. And so the lie which I played upon her in my youth remained with her as an unchallengeable truth to the day of her death." Carlyle said, "'A lie cannot live.' It shows that he did not know how to tell them. If I had taken out a life policy on this one, the premiums would have bankrupted me ages ago. Mark Twain. To be continued.